Hi, I'm Dr. Anna, and today I'd like to talk to you a little bit about sequential hermaphrodism, an interesting but fairly rare behavior that's a reproductive strategy found in some animal species. You see, some species change sex from the one they are born as to the other. When females change into males, then this is called protogeny. But when males change into females, this is called protandry. There are a lot of questions that scientists have had about sequential hermaphrodism. One of those being simply, why does it exist? Why does it happen? And it's an understandable question. We want to know why do some species change sex and others don't. So to kick off our investigation, let's first hear from a species in which some males are males and some are hermaphrodites, and yet they get along quite well. The mangrove killfish. They told me I was here to test my behavioral tendencies, but man, I know why I was really here. I was here for a competition. I used to be a hermaphrodite, but now I'm a man, and I'm better than those hermaphrodites. But I gots to tell you, they did some weird stuff, man. Some real weird stuff, like that maze. I gots to tell you about that maze. What the mangrove killfish is really trying to convey is that he was compared to a hermaphrodite. The maze was used to test their exploration. But that wasn't all, man. That wasn't all. There was a boom! A boom! <laughs> that experiment was to test your boldness. You were actually significantly bolder than the hermaphrodite. Wait, that hermaphrodite? Was that who I had to battle the other day? Was that him? Uh, her? Uh, it? Well, anyway, I whooped that sucker's butt. No, you're battling yourself. You see, the only difference between you and the hermaphrodite was your boldness. I'm bolder? That means I'm better. <laughs> well, not necessarily. You see, natural selection will favor you because you're bolder and therefore you're more willing to get your sperm out there. I'm so excited to talk to you! <laughs> well, hi, baby bristleworm. You know, I'm glad that you came by today because I wanted to talk to you a little bit about some things you might experience as you grow up. Do you know if you were a boy or a girl? I am a boy! Well, that does make sense, but did you know that as you grow up and get big and strong, you might actually become a girl? It can be scary. But why? Why can't I stay a boy forever? Well, have you ever noticed that a lot of friends around your size are boys, but a lot of the grown-ups are mommies? Mm, yeah, yeah, maybe. Well, that's because only the big ones can make a lot of eggs. You see, eggs are really big and they take up space, and so you know, you need a big size body to be able to make a lot of eggs. Okay, but what about, what about daddies? Well, daddies are usually smaller, right? So they make a lot of sperm, and sperm are very, very small, so they can make lots and lots and lots of sperm. Okay, but how do you know that? Don't worry.
sorry about that part. <laughs> okay. But, so, why don't we just say boys or girls the whole time, even if girls are bigger than us? Well, see, this way, all of the, the little ones can help make the sperm, and all the big ones can make the eggs. So, really, it's just to make sure that you have as big of a family as possible. Oh, well, I want to stay a boy forever! Well, good luck. Some boys don't switch, but really, you don't have to worry about it yet, because you're not big enough. Okay. Thanks, Dr. Hannah. Hello, my name is Patella Ferrigenia. Just call me Janine. I'm a limpid from the Mediterranean. As you can see, I'm very large, but normally others of my species don't get this big because we're over harvested from here. We're actually quite endangered, so you should feel honored for me to be here. Anyway, something shocking happened one day to our species. I, being the largest of my species, took, the, took up the responsibility to have a talk with them. This is Dr. Anna, who is subbing in for them. Hello, Janine. As it turns out, the people you're asking about are actually researchers. Really, I find that hard to believe. They went to a bunch of places and collected us. Uh, at first, I thought they were going to eat us, but then they stuck a needle through our, through our private parts, measured us, and then threw us back. So I asked around, and then I found out they measured more than 300 of us. Well, your species is hermaphroditic, correct? Yeah, as you can tell, I'm female, but I wasn't always a female. My species changes from male to female as after we grow to a certain age. I'm not sure why, but I don't see how that matters. Well, I imagine that the researchers are wondering the same thing as you are. Really, I'm still not convinced. Well, you see, the sex of your species is highly dependent on both size and on population. When you're, you guys are bigger, then it makes more sense for you to make eggs, which are bigger. And the reverse is true about being smaller. It's easier to make sperm. It's more efficient. And since your species is pretty flexible in terms of the size requirements, oftentimes when there are only a few large females, then males would turn into females at a much smaller size than usual. Hmm, that is true that harvesting takes away females because they're the largest. It's like males can tell if there aren't enough females in the population. Yes, and this helps to explain why in certain areas you haven't gone extinct. I always thought it was because new females migrated over, but I guess it's actually because males changed much earlier. Right. Your species makes up for this by sequential hermaphroditism. My species is pretty cool. We can adapt from to over-harvesting and female shortage. That definitely answers my question, but that still doesn't make up for how rude the researchers were. But thank you for talking with me, Dr. Anna. Sure. So now you've met with some sequential hermaphrodites. Clearly, each of these guys had their own little quirky characteristics. But how does what they taught us help us answer a question, why does sequential hermaphrodism happen in the first place? Well, scientists have a number of theories, but the main one is the size advantage theory which is what the, the bristle worm and the one that showed us. That when being, say, a large size when female is more advantageous than being a large size when male, then the male won't change the female at that size. Some of my colleagues wanted to test this, so they created a mathematical model, two mathematical models, to assess how costs of changing sex would influence the actual behavior. The first model supported the size advantage theory, and the second one showed that some costs could actually deter the population from being sequentially hermaphroditic in that instance. So essentially, being a hermaphrodite is a good idea when the costs are low and a size advantage is present. So now that we've covered this information and talked to some sequential hermaphrodites themselves, hopefully you now know a little bit more about sequential hermaphroditism.